afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and today we are putting extinct people in focus. Yeah, we're going to actually have extinct people on here to talk about what it's like to be extinct. I know it sounds ridiculous. And it is. Well, for at least 10,000 years, the Sinai lived in the area that's now southeastern BC and north, uh, sorry, southeastern BC and northeastern uh, Washington. You might have heard of them as Arrow Lakes people. Nowadays, many reside on the Colville Reservation in Washington State after the Canada US border sliced through their territory. Few remain in Canada, but when the last registered Sinai died in 1956, the gov this, this country, the Canadian government, uh, declared them extinct, eager to get an entire people people off the books here, I guess, uh, despite being well aware that they were still living in the United States and wanted access to their traditional lands in Canada. So in 2010, when Sinai's man living in the United States came to Canada to harvest an elk on his traditional territory. He called BC Conservation to advise them of this kill, uh, and being a conservation officer himself, he knew at that time that there would be an unlawful hunting charge laid in Canada. That was the whole point, was to take the matter to court, to exert Sinai's rights uh, to their ancestral lands. Well, it took a decade, winding through all the levels of court, but in April 2021, he won a Supreme Court victory. Victory. What that win did was affirm that the Sinaisk are not extinct and that they do, in fact, have rights in this country. Uh, we're going to talk to that harvester, Rick Desotel, and others who are living in Washington about coming back from extinction, uh, what the court decision a year ago has meant to real life to them. Uh, also on the show, the Bayothic from the island of Newfoundland, they were in fact driven to extinction, actually more accurately were murdered off in the early 1800s by European settlers. Adding insult to injury, the remains of some were dug up and taken like trophies back to Scotland's National Museum. Take a look at a clip from APTN Investigate's story, Extinction Event, uh, then I'll tell you what's new in this matter. <laughs> It's our fault. We bear the burden of guilt in the way that the modern day Germans bear a burden of guilt for the Nazis. Because whether our ancestors did it deliberately or turned their backs and allowed it to happen, either way, we're at fault. To think that a distinct people are totally wiped off the face of the earth. It's a crying shame that uh, it came down to that. They were driven slowly from Conception Bay, to Trinity Bay, to Bonavista Bay, to Notre Dame Bay, and then inland. Damaswit lived at least part of her life on these shores. And because she was captured in that month, she was given the name Mary March. It was the European name. It was a European name. And they're the ones that, that were responsible. Following years of negotiations between the federal and provincial governments, Scotland and Indigenous leaders, the remains of two of the last known Beothic were finally returned to Newfoundland in 2020. The partial remains of Damasduit and Nonisabasut arrived back in Newfoundland after being held in Scotland for almost two centuries. Indigenous leaders in the province praised that repatriation. Well, since those remains uh, were returned, they've helped confirm what, that the, while the Baothic are extinct, their DNA lives on. A scientist at Memorial University in St. John's was hired by the, Miyak, the Miyakpakuk uh, Mi'kmaq Nation to conduct this research. He matched DNA from the remains to living people, a finding that was no surprise to the Mi'kmaq, whose oral history includes stories of close relations between the tribes. The man behind that landmark research is Steve Carr. While he is a professor at the Memorial University in Newfoundland, we caught up with him yesterday at the Georgia Tech University in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Steve, thank you for joining us. If you could just give us a little uh, bit of a background as to how, what this research entailed and how you got started. I think Chief Joe uh, had contacted you and that's what got the ball rolling. Yes, um, that I, I've known Chief Joe for about a dozen years. Um, I originally had a member of Miapakuk First Nation did an honors project uh, with me on this question at, at a time when there was very little um, genetic background information. Um, follow, with a follow-up on that, that uh, the chief and I wrote together, and with the contributions of many other people, we wrote a National Geographic Explorer grant. 
uh, National Geographic being interested in um, human diversity, uh, human genetic diversity. And uh, the project, um, and I always emphasize that it is a project of the Miapakuk First Nation of the Mi'kmaq, um, has been to examine uh, their oral history, which says that there was a long period of contact between the Mi'kmaq on Newfoundland and, and the native Beothic. Um, and it's solidly in the it's solidly in the um, in the oral history of the tribe, and that is not necessarily accepted by all people that might be interested in the question. In particular, the uh, the provincial government at least has questioned that. Uh, anthropologists have questioned that. Various other peoples have questioned that. So, I, as a scientist, I come at it with: Is there evidence of that uh, relationship? And Chief comes at it with a slightly different question, <laughs> which is: What is the evidence? <laughs> what is the nature of the evidence that that supports what uh, what our oral history says is true? You know, so Damazwit and Notice the Bat suit. Um, you know, they only had one child, so people say there's no way that that there could be that they could their DNA could live on because it would have died with that infant. But that's mm -hmm. not the case. You have that's not that's not the case at all. And I and uh, what I invite people to consider is uh, now the fancy terms are direct descent and collateral descent. And direct descent means no, no, it's not a subset. And Demazdui, they had only one child who was murdered, in effect. Um, but we know from the genealogy that Ashanan Vadit, mm -hmm. who was uh, Nona Sabaset's niece, we don't know whether it was a paternal niece or a maternal niece, um, he, the, the, he had nieces, she had nieces, Damasdui had nieces, uh, nieces have cousins. Um, the, given a larger tribe of 200 or 1,000 people, there are lots of collateral relatives so a collateral relative is anybody that you are you share a common ancestor with um unless you're in direct line and uh so that is really the question is do we do we have evidence of, of collateral relationships are there cousins yeah so how okay i want to back up a little bit to to the research that you did how did you find people's like whose dna did you use to determine if there was still Biotic DNA alive. Well, there's there's two sources, and the original comparative uh, data were DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited to the through the mother's line and is a very useful tool for that period. Um, the DNA from the Biotic and the Maritime Archaic had been collected by a former student of mine, Anna Duggan, who is now at McMaster University. Um, and the question immediately occurred to me. We had we had data on exactly one Mi'kmaq person, um, and I compared that person's sequence with what was in the Beothic data, and it didn't match. And of course, that's when one uh, swallow does not make a fall. Um, and uh, we didn't have any more evidence of that, but I took that to Chief and said, you know, if we were to do, uh, you know, if we were to look at members of Miapakak, um, I wonder what we would find. And so we developed the proposal. Um, it was approved by the uh, Chief and Council acting as the Health Research Ethics Board for the um, for the tribe, uh, we and we had back and forth with um, uh, with the community. One of the things that arose out of that is that the uh, we, we use a commercial company to do the tests because it's much more efficient to do it that way. We we don't have to to do the experiments, but that company ordinarily supplies. Um, medical advice or it would identify medical conditions and we agreed that we did not want to ask for that. Um, I'm not a doctor, none of the people that are involved in the study 
uh, doctors, so it is very explicitly not a medical uh, investigation. It's a genealogical investigation. Uh, we put the word out, and uh, people began volunteering. Uh, the method of collection is, is what we call a double blind that uh, health, health clinic workers at Meowpacuck uh, would know the person, obviously, who came in to uh, have a, a cheek scraping uh, yeah. inside the mouth, goes into a tube. Uh, the tube has a number. Um, Danny, Danny identifies the, uh, the number on the tube with the individual, and then he hands it to me except that I don't see the names of the individuals and I assign my own coding to each of the intermediate coding. So I look at individuals one through 42 um, and I don't know who they are. Danny doesn't, Danny couldn't figure out anything. And so all of our studies are confidential until as agreed uh, when we reach our conclusions, then we will call the community together and explain what we have what we have found. You uh, there, you found somebody who has the exact uh, DNA of Nona Sabatsu, right? Correct. In, in in 2020, I wrote the paper because it did it did occur to me as part of the question of uh, well, this one McMahon individual um, is not related to any of the uh, maritime archaic or Beothic persons that we know about, but put that in every time you say you think about this <laughs> um, and then the next question well is anybody um, that's currently living and in the the databases that are available which are quite extensive uh, is anybody in those uh, still living and we did find a particular person who had uh, a DNA sequence identical to Nona Sabaset. The interesting thing about that person is that um, that person hi hiding gender at the moment, uh, so I've learned not to give away too much information, is that that person was actively interested in genealogy, um, was unaware of uh, new, new genealogy in the family six generations back, no indication of indigenous ancestors, oh, uh, no suspicion of indigenous ancestors, uh, but necessarily, and, I, and I've spoken to him and he's, there I gave it away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Better you than me, because my follow-up question was going to probably give it yeah. away. No, I, I have spoken to him and, and uh, you know, and that he's anxious to follow up uh, and we're, we're looking at, at Six generations, we're looking at something like 150 years, and 150 years does not take us to the, the last Beothics in 1820. Um, but the question of, of, of collateral relationships comes up, and uh, what we have is not similar, but identical. Um, and there's, uh, it's a fairly broad curve that you could be, you could be identical with somebody and be separated from them by a couple of hundred years, several hundred years, but it does establish a relationship that is as close to Nona Sabaset as other Beothic that we know about. This, how does this feel to you? I mean, this is this is huge. I mean, these are extinct people. People have, for centuries have been like, oh, they're, they were just wiped off. You, you know, oral history had said, we don't yes. believe that to be true. Your science has confirmed what the oral history was saying. You know, it's kind of, it's a huge thing. Like, how, how did you feel when, when this all kind of the, came I out? Was I, I was surprised and because we have not, um, we have now begun uh, the, the the one fellow that we found, okay, that um, that was a general indication that Beothic DNA has survived in amongst so ancient DNA has survived into the modern modern peoples, um, and always the problem is well you only know about the people that you look at, and so then the question arose can we establish what is generally true that Beothic DNA has survived, whether you regard the Beothic ex as extinct or not? And that's a, another subtle question. Mm -hmm. 
then we looked at, uh, and now we've looked at Myopacuc, and we have found that what, uh, and the work is still very much in progress, but we have found that what was generally true for the population is specifically true for the Myopacuc First Nation. And um, because those data are not published yet, I don't, I don't feel free to say anything more, uh, more specific than that. But it is very much like uh, I can remember long ago uh, being recruited to work on a project where I said, "Well, there's no way that this is going to that this could be true." Um, and we did our first round of analysis, and golly, it's uh, it's true. Um, I, it was it was huge. It was huge. Is that that I that I accepted the oral history. Um, the the Mi'kmaq oral history is just as good as, for example, the Vinland sagas. Mm -hmm. And we think that the Vinland sagas, well, there's something special because they're written down. Well, no, they weren't for several hundred years um they were finally written down in a quite obscure european language and somehow that seems to attach some cachet uh to to the to the written record as opposed to an oral tradition and i and i i, I see both sides of it but the more i have worked with with chief and council and the community and, and the more we've entered into uh, a relationship of trust, the more I see how oral history is important. Uh, there's also a oral history that is, in fact, written history. There is history written on birch bark. There is history that is written in wampum belts. There is mm -hmm. history that is written in beadwork. And, and in fact, um, uh, the, the, the highly technical mathematical analysis that we have done here, uh, when I put it together as a 3D model to make it easier to visualize, I realized, well, this is a wampum, because what is a wampum? It's, uh, it's something that tells a story with beads. And I asked a couple of my friends in the community, uh, is that is that a fair comment? Is that is that a respectful comment? And it was yes. And I, I have presented that that initial model to Chief, and Chief was quite thrilled to have that. Okay. And uh, it's much easier. It's much easier to uh, go to his office. And uh, as he said, I, I think I can explain it. <laughs> Well, you do better than me because I was looking at your uh, the boiled down version yeah. of your research yeah. and I was still uh, scratching my head at some parts of it and thinking I should have paid more attention in grade 11 biology and uh, maybe came up with more than the it, it, 52 actually, I had. It, yeah, it's actually pretty easy because all the, the very the very technical diagram that we had in the 2020 paper and the and the draft figures that we've got now, all they really are is family trees that extend over thousands of years and that you don't have um we we we, we know who nona sabasets and demasdui's immediate relatives were we don't have dna from them um so the closest relatives are the people that are found in various grave sites mm. uh the grave sites were examined in all cases appropriate permission has been obtained. Um, I used to, uh, w w with Damasdui and uh, Nona Sabaset, they have been recovered, as you have said, they've been recovered from the museum in, in Edinburgh. They are on the island. The Their exact position is a well-guarded secret. I'm not oh. privy to that because I don't need to do that um, and they uh, will be I think restored to the earth restored to Turtle Island and when I began this study my my museum uh, scientist thing was jumping up and down saying but 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 you know we might want to look at them right. again later and then the other part of me said that um, these people in particular, Nona Sabaset and Damasdu, we, we know when they were born, we know their names, we know when they 
uh, died. We know when they were murdered. We know the circumstances of their life. And to behave in any other way than that these are fellow human beings mm. is, is disrespectful and is a, was a lesson for me. Uh, and and working working with the chief and the uh, and the Mi'kmaq and Miyapukek is an ongoing lesson for me in uh, in uh, how indigenous peoples have been treated on yeah. this continent, on this island. Well, we are so thankful you could share your work with us. We have a great admiration for what's been done, and we look forward to what else you guys are all working on together out in Mi'kmaq. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, Melissa. I guess a topic for a different show might be uh, if people who have that DNA end up coming back to say that they now want Section 35 rights. So I guess we'll see about that. It's also worth mentioning uh, in an earlier discussion I'd had with Mr. Carr, he noted that Newfoundland has this romantic fondness for the Beothic. They've got statues, as we saw there, memorials to celebrate them. Uh, and yet they take this more adversarial stance against the Mi'kmaq, who are still there. I thought that was an interesting observation. You know, you're loved when you're dead and you're tolerated or worse when you're living. Um, we need to take a break. But when we come back, I'm going to introduce you to a few living, breathing people who the government of Canada had said have been extinct since 1956, but the Supreme Court of Canada had something else to say about that. We'll explain when we come back. Welcome back. Let's go to our social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrusko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Melissa. Leading up to today's show, we received some interesting comments online about groups that are considered extinct. Let's take a look. First, from Barbski on Facebook. It is only the governments who want to believe this to be true. Read the history of how the soldiers made the Beothic people walk in a ditch and then shot the people as they walked. Bonnie commented, I wish someone would test every tribe, at least a hundred from each tribe, Y-DNA and mitochondrial. My husband is Cree and tested 50% Mesoamerican. Michael on Twitter said, so does Neanderthal DNA live on today, mostly in Europe but in North America too. Neanderthals predate the Beothic and Mi'kmaq, they are extinct too. From Ange on Instagram, people often say that about Mayan people in Guatemala. They're still there. Lastly, from Levi, if it, is, if it was up to the white people, indigenous peoples would all be considered extinct. Thank you, everyone, who shared their thoughts. If you would like to add your opinion, here's how. Join our conversation now. Send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Like us on Facebook on our APTN news page and follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. In 2010, Rick Desotel, an American living on the Colville Reservation in Washington State, headed north to British Columbia to harvest an elk. Uh, he called BC conservation officials, knowing that it was going to trigger charges for unlawfully hunting in Canada. And that was the whole point. Over a decade, the matter would wind through courts right up to the Supreme Court of Canada, which ruled in a 7-2 decision that Desotel, a Sinaisic man, is one, not extinct, and two, has Section 35 rights to his ancestral lands. That's from uh, northern, uh, northeastern Washington to southeastern BC. I chatted with APTN's Brett Forrester right after that landmark ruling. Take a look. Brett, before we get into the ruling, can you take us through the background of this case? Certainly. So in 2010, Rick Desotel, a Sinaixed man from what is now Washington State, traveled north to British Columbia in order to hunt for elk. Uh, now his hunt was successful. However, when he reported it to provincial authorities, they charged him with hunting without a license. Now in the lower court, he was acquitted. The Crown opted to appeal and he was acquitted again and the Crown sought leave once again to appeal to the High Court uh, and now this morning uh, the High Court issued its ruling which was once again favorable uh, to Mr. Um, De Sotel. So the Supreme Court ruling says that these people aren't extinct, they indeed have rights to hunt and fish on their traditional territory in this country despite being American citizens. 
Well, we, <laughs> the, the Passamaquoddy, they were interveners uh, in that case that we were just talking about. They too were divided by the Canadian-U.S. border in their traditional territory that covers parts of uh, New Brunswick and Maine. The New Brunswick Media Co-op uh, for their program NB Debrief with Tobin Haley sat down with Chief Hugh Akegi uh, to discuss the impact that the colonial border has had on his people. Let's take a look from, at a clip from that. So, as I understand it, mm -hmm. um, the Passamaquoddy in Maine have been federally recognized as a tribe. Yes. But in Canada, uh, the nation citizens, to use your language, mm -hmm. um, do not have First Nations status. No, the Passamaquoddy aren't recognized as the First Nations in Canada. Absolutely. Why is that? It goes back to a an Indian, Indian agent who was supposed to travel from Fredericton and take a census of our people when they did it for the Maliseets and they did it for the Mi'kmaq. Mm -hmm. This goes back to 1951. If you look at all the maps in uh, Canada, you'll see that they definitely have native indigenous territories, but there's always been this blank um, south of the St. John River, I'm going to call it the Bullistook from now on because that's the real name, and the St. Croix, which is the boundary, and our Scudic River, by the way. So how is it that indigenous people lived all, in all these places, but no, 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 native, no Indians lived here? Well, that's one of those questions. Remember I said I had to ask questions in order to uh, learn who I was mm -hmm. and learn about my people? This was one of those questions. How is it that there are no Indians here? Oh, by the way, as soon as you cross the border, you start to see Indians. Mm -hmm. And I said that properly. We weren't being seen. When you cross the border and people say, oh, there are Indians over there. Why aren't there any Indians over here? It's because their vision depended upon their mind, and their mind depended upon what they were being told, and that is that there are no Indians in this territory. So 1951, they left us south of Lifts. 1951, we disappeared as a tribe, as a people, as a First Nation. I don't think First Nation wasn't on the books then anyway. So when it comes to recognition, we have always been here. We've always been a people. We've always been in our territory. But Canada failed its obligation when it came to registering us as Indigenous peoples. So you can call it a mistake. I kind of call it a, uh, I think it was more of a happy coincidence for Canada. Canada doesn't like problems. Border tribes are problems. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we're talking about today, border tribes being problems. Well, Dick Dezotel is the man that was the front of that Supreme Court victory. Noteworthy, he was himself a conservation officer for 25 years. He's now working in fisheries in his community. We chatted very, very early this morning with him before he took off on the water for work. Here's that interview. Rick, thanks for taking time out of your morning. It's great to catch up with you. And I have to say, uh, I've been a journalist for 25 years. This is the first time in my career that I've talked to somebody who was extinct. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> okay. What is it? I mean, we could kind of joke about it. It was a serious case. But honestly, you know, you, you were brought back from extinction in the eyes of this uh, government of, in Canada just two years ago. I mean, is there... Do you find some humor in that? Is there, uh, I, I would assume, uh, you're, the family and, and other uh, Sinai's living uh, in, this, in the States do find some entertainment in being non-extinct? Yes, I would feel that they do. Uh, right next to being moved out of the museum in, you know, and, and next to the dinosaur <laughs> uh, display there, we, we feel per, pretty uh, good about not being extinct anymore, yes. <laughs> So I want to talk about the before the historical day uh, of harvesting a moose, or, or sorry, an elk in Canada on your ancestral lands for Sinai's living in the U.S. Can you tell us about your personal connection to the land? Uh, personal connection, I guess, would uh, go back uh, 
ways to uh, when I was at a road blockade there in the 80s back up in uh, BC area up there protecting uh, burial grounds that they was building the road through. That's right. I forgot that that was the case. So you, I mean, this is, you, you haven't been quietly extinct since being declared extinct in the 50s, right? You, there's, you guys are quite um, active activists on this side yes, of the border yes. as well. Yes, 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 yes. So what's been going on? So it's been a year uh, since the Supreme Court ruling in your favor. What's, what has it changed? Uh, what's changed? Uh, um, you know, this COVID thing has just been kind of hammering on people getting across the border. And uh, just the, the, the paperwork you have to fill out, the tests you got to get to to get a, across the uh, into Canada from the United States here kind of has really held people back from, from, you know, going up into that part of the country, up into our traditional area. Mm. Um, I understand that there's uh, the Peskatomikati Nation, they were an intervener in your case, uh, I do believe. You know, they, just like the Sinex, uh had their territory cut into by the Canada-U.S. border, their traditional lands uh, and waters extend from, uh, or into, I guess, b uh, both New Brunswick and Maine. Um, have you heard from them since your case? Like, how has it impacted them and their, their access to land and their harvesting rights? Uh, I've had a number of tribes that the 49th parallel, you know, has cut in half and stuff like that there, and just in the decision of the Supreme Court decision and stuff, uh, call me up and congratulate me on the court case, um, as in their follow-up or how they're, you know, proceeding in, in their uh, <laughs> trans-border crossing procedures are going, I'm, I'm not too sure, but I, I hope them all the best, and uh, I'm hoping my case may have helped them, help them, or help them, uh, you know, get back to their traditional lands and whatnot. Did you ever think at any point in your life that you would be like this, you would be the point person, you'd be the one to take this fight all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada? It took a, a decade of, of your life to fight this fight. Did, did you ever see that in the cards before it actually happened? Uh, no, I, I, I thought it would be, you know, just be decided in a lower, a lower court, uh, regional decision that it wouldn't, uh, but one of the very first lawyers that I, uh, was acquainted with in my first case right in the lower courts of Castle Guard there, when I explained him, explained to him what I was doing, he says, boy, you got a, a great case and you're probably going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. And he said, by the time you get there, only you're going to be an old man. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years later, I'm saying, yeah, it really did happen that way, you know. Well, quite honestly, I mean, you're already extinct. I don't know if the extinct age, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm approaching that extinct age, yes. <laughs> no. Um, you know, 80% of your people's territory uh, is in Canada. It's in BC. What do you want to see happen now? I mean, obviously, you know, co as you mentioned, COVID is a factor in all of this. Um, but, you know, let's pretend we take COVID out of the mix a little bit. COVID, we, we get over it. Um, what do you want to see happening next for the CNEGs who are living in Washington and accessing your traditional territory? Uh, and what I would like to see happen is more interaction with uh, uh, different departments, government officials, stuff like that there, and some of the decision-making that goes on in our traditional territory, and helping them out in, in uh, ways that we could help them out, and different things that could be done on our part to help them out. Do you personally plan to to uh, harvest either you know game or fish uh, on your traditional territory that's on this side of the uh, Canada U.S. border? Do I harvest? Do you got it, Do you have any plans in the, in the United States? In no, United on this States on this here? side in Canada on Canada side. Do you have any plans to be up hunting or fishing? Oh yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll be back up there this fall. Nice. 
Well, Rick, it was great to catch up with you. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a year that I was, I'm sure you would have thought that there would have been a little bit more uh, come out of the Supreme Court win in the last year, but COVID uh, certainly has put a little bit of a damper on that. But we're thankful that you could join us and talk about that victory. All righty, thank you. So after being taken off the extinct list by that Supreme Court ruling, where did the Sinaigs go from here in their fight to be back on their uh, traditional lands in Canada? We find out after the break. Welcome back. We are talking about a Supreme Court case uh, that lasted 10 years involving the Sinex, uh who fought for their recognition to use their uh, ancestral lands that were in Canada despite living south of the border in the United States. Uh, I spoke with Brett Forrester about that last April when that decision came down. Uh, these people had been extinct uh, since 1956 in the eyes of Canada, but this court victory uh, kind of proved that that's not the case. Take a look at that clip from back then. Almost as big of a story uh, is the fact that the federal government has declared the Sinai extinct uh, here in the 50s. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background on that? How are we going to court with people who are extinct? Yes, you know, it's kind of interesting. You'd have to naturally imagine that if they can litigate a court case uh, in Canada that they were that they are obviously not extinct. However, this was not a question that the court uh, was asked to determine, and so therefore they did not issue a ruling upon it. So, if they, uh, you know, need to assert their their presence as a living, breathing Indigenous nation who has a claim to lands in Canada, they're going to have to do that through some other mechanism because it wasn't contained in this ruling. So, again, that's something that I'm told they're looking forward to doing uh, moving forward. Uh, we've got another uh, formerly extinct person here joining us now. It's always nice to think, try to get your head around how ridiculous that is. Uh, Roger Finley, he's a counselor of the Colville Confederated Tribes. Uh, that's where many Sinex have been living since colonization when their territory was sliced uh, by the Canada-U.S. border. He joins us now from the Colville Reservation in Washington State. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I just want to remind our audience, uh, if they're just joining us since the break, that your ancestral land spans that north-south valley from present-day Kettle Falls, Washington, to uh, Revelstoke in B.C. Yes. Uh, that's what it was pre-contact. And 80% of your traditional territory was north of that uh, international border there. Um, I want to start by talking to you about, you know, give us, what are some misconceptions about your people? Well, it's weird that you extinct the people that you pretty much just pushed off the land. That's, and like I said earlier, if that was a desert, they wouldn't even care who lived there or, or what was there. But since it is the lands and there's a ton of water that comes through there, power, timber, everything else, it's, it's easier to extinct the people than to fight against them. If they're extinct, they have no voice. Well, I mean, it was just, it was so convenient to take an entire people yes. off the books, right? When yes. the last registered one here passes away, and they knowing full well that there's a, a whole population south of the border, and it's just, you know, quickly rubber stamp that, that big extinct stamp on there. Well, and moving forward, we still have those issues. You know, we're now they're in the truth and reconciliation stage after the case is won, and, and they have to take that hard stance and, Oh, we're sorry. Now, how do we move forward? How how do we make it right by you that you're extinct now? And you know, we're establishing the government. We're establishing things. You know, we already hunt there and fish there because we established that through the Dizitel decision. Now, moving forward, collaboration with other governments and tribes on you know what's best for the wildlife. You know, the the fish and and the land itself. Moving forward. Well, that Supreme Court decision really was not the end of something. I mean, it took 10 years to get to that point. It seems like that would be kind of the finale, but it really isn't. It's just the beginning yeah. of uh, all the work that has to be done, which you were just talking about. Uh, I understand that BC is hosting two uh, public information forums on the Columbia River Treaty. That's on May 16th and June 15th with the intent to modernize the treaty in both countries. Roger, can you fill us in on that? A lot, a lot of people uh, on this side of the border have, don't know what any of this is about. 
So those are the kind of things that I leave to the attorneys. Those, <laughs> if you get into a little one of these battles, yeah, what you say now can and will be used against you <laughs> later on. So we're we're in those negotiations. Uh, hopefully we have a good seat at the table to be part of that. I think historically and traditionally, the native people are are way better at managing the fish and the wildlife than anybody else. So, you know, I hope that they look to us to, to help and have some input in that. So, but all of us know it's usually about the dollars. Yeah. How many, when you say all of us, how many, how many are there? Uh, Sinai's people? Yeah. So we're, we're currently counting that now in, in just Colville's, we have over 3,500. And so, but, you know, when people moved out of Canada, were forced out of Canada, some went to the Spokane Res, the Scalabell Reservation, Coeur d'Alene, Okanagan, you know, so we don't know. And that's what this case is doing. It, it's opening everybody's eyes to say, hey, I am Sinaiks. And in the court ruling, it says for all Sinaiks people. So it doesn't matter if you are Spokane tribal member or Coeur d'Alene tribe or you know, Kalispell, if you're Sinaiks, you're Sinaiks. And how do you, how will you determine who is Sinaiks? Like you just, you know, people come forward and, and identify like that, or is there a test that needs to be proven? Oh, no, it, we'll go, I'm hoping moving forward, we'll go off lineage. You know, in, in the past, we went off blood quantum and that, all that was is the government trying to bring us out of extinction. So, you know, what defines you as a native person? It isn't your blood quantum, it's your culture. You know, what you practice, who you are, you know, what you do for the land and the fish and the animals. I, you know, they, the, the, I've heard uh, Shelly Boyd, who's a, who's an activist living at Colville. Yes. Uh, she, she was supposed to be joining us today. Uh, she had said that this fight was about ancestors and future generations because she doesn't want your nation's children to grow up being declared extinct. I mean, for you yourself, your whole life, can you tell us, like, what what did it feel like to be to know that you know there's there's a government, there's a country that says that you don't exist? Well, we fight uphill battles all the time. I mean, that's just <laughs> you you get those put in front of you, and you do what you need to do. You hire the best attorneys, and you move forward against them. And now it's education. Yeah. You know, we need to educate the people on who we are. And what it was, the history of that before they were there and said that we were extinct. We were one of the largest people, largest land-based people that managed that territory. And so education's the key. It's the key in everything. You know, with all the youth today, they're the ones we're passing the torch on to. When I'm done here, I'll be passing the torch to somebody else. So if we don't educate those youth good enough to take the torch, to, to get rid of the prejudice and everything else, then we're finally losing battle already. Are they keen to pick this up? I mean, the, a lot of the heavy lifting has yes. been done. You know, what's, yes. what's the youth in your community? What are what are they saying about this victory? So a lot of them are direct descendants of Rick Dizatel, right? So, you know, they, they already have an interest. You know, they've been watching this case closely. Um, hopefully his granddaughter will will be working as summer youth doing some of this work with Shelly during the summer and that's that's how you do it we develop a youth council in each one of our districts on Colville so they kind of get the governmental structure and and they come to us with their problems and then we try and help them find a solution whether it be in school or after school activities so they get used to this kind of process uh, you know, you you aren't alone. The Sinaiks aren't alone in this. This this is a has been a problem of being able to cross that Canada-U.S. border for many tribes um, whose traditional territory spanned uh, these regions long before uh, European settlers came and colonized the territory. Have you heard from other tribes about you know how they're taking this case and and advancing it for their people? Well, and that's that's one of the things that we knew this was going to be across the border. Well, if this case was one and, you know, I was really surprised because, you know, the decision came as quick as it did from Canada because they know what this means 
to all the other border tribes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about with collaboration, other tribes, other governments to, to do what's best for the people that before didn't know a border. You know, they said, oh, if you're on this side, you're Canadian. If you're on this side, you're American. The natives looked down and said, what line? I don't see no line. Yeah. You know, um, and I understand that there's a ceremony planned on this side of the border uh, in June. Can you tell us what's in store? Yes, June 10th. So hopefully we'll have a really good celebration. Um, I think that's going to be one of the first big meetings where we invite other Aboriginal peoples, other governments, um, pretty much tell them Snikes are coming home. Uh -huh. This is what we want to do. Um, will you work with us? What is there a role for settlers um, to be doing in, in all of this? I mean, you have the court victory, but the non-Indigenous community, um, what should they be doing to help? And most of the people there, I mean, we've had meetings in Nelson and other things. Uh, they're there. They're open arms you know they they know historically and traditionally how tribes manage lands you know we we manage it for the wildlife and the fish and you know the beauty not the dollar and so they embrace us you know they, they welcome us everybody that i talk to says thank you we, you know we, your breath of fresh air thanks for coming where can we find out about details? Because uh, I, I would assume there's a lot of people, you know, who are watching today who may want to uh, pop by if they're in that region to participate and celebrate with you. Where would we find so details of that? This is all new. We're we're trying to get uh, Facebook and, and things like that up and running. So I'm sure there'll be more information. And as soon as that comes forward, I'll make sure that they get in touch with you and it'll be on, you guys have a website obviously that has links and everything else and and we'll try and get that up to you so the links and everything are right there and they can just click on it. we would like to come and cover this too i mean it would be f fabulous to celebrate being d delisted as extinct i mean i don't know that that's something i'll ever have the opportunity to do again in my career is it can you get your head around this i mean it's I, I, you've been living with this your whole life. It's you know it's new to us to hear just kind of the absurdity of it. But you know, is it still that giant of a deal to you to be thinking about having that celebration? Well, it's. I explain it this way: after you go to Canada, you know, I've been all over the country, all over the. I've traveled a lot of places, and and some of those places are cool and it's neat, and it's like, yo, know, I might go back there and visit. But after you have been to our territory, that's all you think about. Yeah. When can I go back? Do you, do you get up here very often to to use the land? As much as I can. Yeah. It, almost any free time I get. That's. Yep. The, I mean, just the exploring of the new territory to us because it's it's been taken away from us for so long. Mm -hmm. You know the they have a different fish there, Gerards. You know that. You know, they're a huge lake trout, you know, that's really intriguing. It's like, yes, I would love to bring my pontoon boat up and catch a few of those. And and my last question for you, just more broadly, because uh, I'm not sure that necessarily our audience is familiar with uh, Colville tribes. It's 12 tribes that are part of your confederation. Is that right? What do you what else yep. do you guys have on the go there? It's a it's a big, busy community there. If you could just fill us in a little bit. Yes, we're 12 bands. Um, the bands come from all over, Wenatchee, Palouse, and, you know, we pretty much all the bands that were pushed somewhere were pushed to Colville. Anyone that were in that area just got pushed to the Colville Reservation. So that's what makes it so diverse. I, you know, 12 bands is a lot to, to govern. You know, uh, it's, I mean, you're here, you're there, you're up there, you're down, you're over, and so... But it, it makes the day go fast. We have a lot going on. You know, a lot of our work is with fisheries, um, dams, you know, getting salmon restoration, just, you know, things that, that help the environment, help us. 
Well, busy is good. It keeps us all out of trouble, I suppose, if you look at it like that. We're going to uh, definitely want to come and join you guys' celebration in June when you're there. So keep us up on those plans, and we will keep up our audience on those plans, too, because I'm sure some of them in that region, like I said, would love to come and join that, too. Roger, Finley, thank you so much for joining us and uh, kind of helping us flesh this all out. And welcome back from extinction. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say thank that you. to you. <laughs> It's good to be back. It's good to be back. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. We are all yeah. out of time for this show. Thanks uh, so much for joining us. And don't forget that all In Focus episodes are available as podcasts. You can find them on our website, aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you back here next week.